Hi there, my name is David Reeside, and this is Developing Carbon Stories, a podcast about the project developers creating the most innovative and impactful carbon projects in the world. Developing Carbon Stories is a project by Abatable, a carbon intelligence and procurement platform that helps companies purchase high-quality carbon offsets. Each episode, I speak with an entrepreneur from a different part of the carbon ecosystem and talk about their journey so far and how they are acting on climate change. Thanks for joining me today, Paul. Um, It's great to have you on. Great to be with you, Dave. This is uh, exciting. My yeah, first, joining us uh, from podcast. from Australia, we've managed to make the the time difference uh, time difference work out for this one. I normally start off with the with with this question just to kind of give a bit of context to the listeners. But mm-hmm. um, you're the founder and CEO of Cassinia Environmental um, mm-hmm. Landscape Restoration Company based in Victoria, Australia. How did you get into the climate change landscape restoration space? Oh, that journey. Well, that journey it's sort of woven throughout my whole career, probably. And I don't know if I've ever shared this directly with you, but I, I, I did a Bachelor of Agriculture, a uh, Bachelor of Applied Science in Agriculture, and followed it up by a, with a, a master's looking at how farmers value nature, basically. And I finished that in 98. And at the end of that, I'd sort of decided I'd, I was really frustrated by the way government funding for nature seemed so inconsistent and, and so episodic and driven by election cycles and unpredictable. And and I was like, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a market-based way. And I remember driving, I remember exactly where I was, where I heard this um, ABC radio story about carbon. And I'm like, this is it. This is the ticket that can be the way that landscape managers get to really invest heavily in, in nature. And, um, and what year was this? How long ago was this? Uh, this is like 2000 or 1999. It was might have even been 98, but I, I'd say oh. it was late 99 or 2000. And um, I got together with a, a friend of mine who was a designer and I was like, this is, you know, and I, I, I'd, I was working in that space. I might have even been working as a land care facilitator at the time and said, this is it. So we, we realised that trees store carbon really slowly. So we came up with a concept of like 10 years of carbon that you could buy up front from a effectively a 10 year old tree. And we started to, to kick around this idea of, of, of T10 or which was the a ton of carbon, the tons of carbon sequestered over 10 years. Anyway, that was the early start we, the company with then was called greenhouse balanced. And that was in 2000. And it took, to be honest, it took four years for me to open a bank account. So it took four years before anything happened. So it didn't get a lot of traction immediately. It was... No, it was pretty okay. slow. It was yeah. early days. And certainly nature-based solutions were the least attractive um, form of the carbon market back then. Mm. And yeah, everyone was quite skeptical that if they let trees into the into the carbon market, the market would be flooded and there'd be no room for renewables. So <laughs> That's so, yeah, very... so interesting, given the situation now where there's such a, a supply shortage and, and people are screaming out for nature-based solutions. I know. It's so, it's so, so different. It's so amazing. But permanence, you know, was an issue back then that people couldn't get their heads around yeah. with trees. And I mean, still is. Um, still is an issue that people debate still is. with nature-based. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But not nowhere near as much as, as back then. And one of the ways around permanence was this sort of temporary crediting period that the CDM came up with and there was sort of innovative ways of addressing some of the nature-based solutions problems that to be honest probably you know probably made it the the, the workarounds the fixes were so clunky that they sort of locked nature-based solutions out for probably 10 years or maybe 15 years so that's how I got into it yeah right that was the beginnings and so that was, I mean, that was greenhouse balance. Um, and mm. then that sort of, did that, I mean, did that morph into what is now Cassinia Environmental? Yeah, um, that's right. right. Okay. And so I guess it went from um, something that was quite, yeah, heavily focused on carbon um, and then moved into more yep. biodiversity offsets for a while. Exa- well, that's to, right. Yeah. Know, but it was always... more general landscape restoration. Yeah, that's right. We're, but we always called carbon the co-benefit. The real game for us was always mm. like biodiversity and, and connection, landscape connectivity, because we were thinking about 
you know, how can this facilitate sort of reconnection of landscapes? How can the carbon markets work for, for that story? So we, we, I remember saying 20 years ago, you know, carbon's about fourth on our list, um, but it's the only one we get paid for. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's about so species, pr species protection. It's about salinity was a big issue back then in Victoria, particularly like it was about sort of land protection, land systems protection thinking about erosion and salinity. And then it was about connectivity. Um, so biodiversity in the macro. Uh, so with species preservation in the, in the sort of micro and, and connectivity in the, in the macro and then land, land systems protection and then carbon. And that was a great, you know, that was a great uh, Trojan horse to, to make these nature-based solutions really work. Yeah, that's interesting. But, I mean, I, I like, I always am interested by this question of whether, um, you know, the carbon market is a, a solution in of itself that developers should be, you know, helping deliver, or whether it's more of a finance tool to help you do, mm. to help developers do really what they what they really want to do. You know, the localized work. Yeah. Do you think it? Do you think it can be both? I mean, it feels like for you I think it's, it's got to be both. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's got to be both because I think, um, I, and I remember, you know, I'm, I'm my, my head's in the twenty year ago space. I remember saying <laughs> twenty years ago, if it's just about carbon then nature-based solutions are not the place to put your money. But if it's about, you know, saving the world and, and the whole big picture, then they're by far the best value because we get so much when we invest in nature-based solutions where, whereas, you know, some of the other sort of carbon-only solutions are, are, are very much siloed and sure they'll deliver that, deliver that one benefit, but they'll miss out on the potential for all the others. And, the world's very focused on carbon as it should be, but it also should be focused on a bunch of other things as well. And um, there's a bunch of, you know, biodiversity, particularly from my perspective, has been one that we've got a convention on, a UN convention, but nobody is really finding the mechanisms by which we can realise the goals of that convention. And they're, in my opinion, every bit as important as the, as the climate change, as the framework convention on climate change. Mm. And so you think the balance that we've got is a little bit off. It's a little bit too skewed towards carbon, this carbon central paradigm that we're yeah, in. Yeah, well, moment. it certainly was 10 years ago, I think. Mm. I think it's moving, you know, the, the focus on nature-based solutions now means that um, I think it's moving closer to where it should be. Um, and I hate to sound like an optimist, but um, I feel like... <laughs> The momentum's with us on the carbon, on the climate change thing. There's so much human capacity interested in this. And, you know, we still mm. haven't, we haven't, you know, we haven't made it yet, but we've got so much human intellect and human energy and human capacity focused on that, that problem that I think we'll, we'll actually get there. Um, mm. And, but, but I'm not sure with a lot of the others, you know, um, yeah. and biodiversity is the one that I think is, is the one that we also need to put a fair bit of human energy and capacity and capital into. Mm. But they well, can come together, you know. It's interesting yeah. we're talking about nature-based solutions for carbon and, mm. you know, there's so much of synergy between what we need to deliver with, with um, biodiversity and with carbon and it's great to see that there's capital flowing into that now. Well, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because I actually wanted to touch on um, the Eco Australia product, which, which you were... Mm. Um, which you helped design or co-designed or led the design mm. of, um, you know, yeah. how, many, how, how many years ago was that? Um, uh, it'd be five years ago, four or five. Five years ago. Yeah. Five and, years ago, yeah. Yeah, and for the, I mean, for the and, people listening who, who aren't aware of uh, Eco Australia, um, actually, perhaps you'd be better to, to explain it but if you want to well, give the, the spiel. Um, yeah, yeah, give the spiel. So <laughs> I'd been working in the, in, the, in the compliance biodiversity offset space so although we don't have a, a really sort of functional focused international market on biodiversity in Australia, several of the states have had a fairly um, fairly rigid approach to any sort of impacts on biodiversity being needing to be offset. So there's been a market springing up for compliance biodiversity offsets in Victoria and a bunch of other states in Australia. And we'd sort of felt that it's a bit it's a bit wrong that the only way to protect biodiversity in a, from a, from a state, you know, sanctioned a state accredited perspective is by actually doing land clearing 
that's silly. So why don't we take this state-based approach and convert those units to the voluntary market and let, you know, and let voluntary buyers protect biodiversity in a way that's accredited by the state, accredited by the government, but um, delivers, you know, biodiversity gain without any loss. Um, that was the concept. So we, we worked um, sort of through a model that could, could really represent that well and had um, third party uh, registry basically managing the voluntary side of it. The state was obviously doing all the accreditation and issuing the, 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 uh, the credits, but then we converted those over to voluntary and, and, and let people be able to buy them. And then we, we approached um, South Pole and said, what would it look like to bundle these with, with carbon? So we brought to them the, the concept, I suppose, and the, the accreditation and, and, and the, the name of an Australian biodiversity unit. Um, and then they bundled those up with carbon and created this Eco Australia product, um, which has a carbon component to it, but also a biodiversity component. And, you know, we were providing that biodiversity component here in Australia. So, so yeah, you've got some really see, good traction. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so sorry. you essentially took the, the biodiversity compliance market and then made your own voluntary market so that you had these um, biodiversity offsets stapled mm. into a carbon credit. And then you mm. had this, this new unique project which brought together the carbon benefit and the Australian impact. Because, um, mm. yeah, like you said, I mean, finding a, you know, at, at the time, particularly like a carbon credit in Australia was mm. particularly... Was most well, expensive. Hard. I mean, yeah, hard and expensive, and, and nature-based stuff was like the acu market was sort of yet to flourish at that point. So it was a really nice way of seeing, you know, on on ground, real tangible stuff happening in Australia, and and great stories and good partnerships too, and partnering with mm -hmm. indigenous communities. One of those projects, particularly Mount Sandy. Um, mm -hmm which I think, yeah, you saw, um, yeah, yeah. had, yeah, had some great sort of social outcomes as well and, and continues to. I was actually just over there last weekend. Over uh, in South Australia did, visiting? Yeah, yeah I was yeah, okay. visiting Mount Sandy and we did a heap of planting and met with up with guys you know, Wayne and Daryl and Clyde. And <laughs> it was a beautiful time. Um, actually, I don't know if we... I don't know how these podcasts work in terms of referencing other stuff, but um, uh, his we can reference, Holmes, let's Prince, reference away. We can reference, you can cut it out if yeah. you need to, but uh, <laughs> um, Prince Charles uh, Sustainable Markets Initiative. Um, did I tell you about this? They've how made they, a little They video. did a, a, docu, a little doco on it, right? Yeah, a little eight minute doco on that story, which mm. doesn't reference Eco Australia or South Pole. Or the, specifically, it's more about the relationship that 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 formed but yeah it's a great little sort of unpacking of a of a, a relationship and a partnership and a, a project um, yeah because this was a partnership between of... it was a partnership between so we had south pole and Cassini obviously partnering with, with mm -hmm. eco australia and then delivering that with the um raukan community the indigenous community yep. in south australia yep. and that was spearheaded by by your relationship with um clyde and rose clyde Is that right? yeah and rose yeah yep yeah and so yeah. that's the the partnership which was which was picked up by the by the doco right yeah that's it yep. yeah okay yeah it's great and and you know yeah it, it's really flourished and uh i think it gives us a really interesting like it's the carbon market sort of opening up a possibility of what does it look like for um you know for for land managers to be delivering I suppose you'd say ecosystem services um, mm -hmm. and being paid for that and, and sort of turning their attention and their, their energy to, you know, really responsible, good land management. And when it's traditional mm -hmm. owners that are doing that, and we've got this social angle of, of, you know, traditional owners being um, able to get back onto their own country and work their own country. And it's, it's really interesting that Rose's mm -hmm. grandma was like born under a, a tree not far from the project site like really? yeah, this is like really i don't know this is like goosebumps like actually yeah. this project is enabling you know you to work and manage and 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 live on 
the country that your grandma was born on, like literally born on, um, that was her country. Um, it's amazing. It is. Yeah. So it opens the door to thinking about, okay, well, how can we do more of this sort of stuff? Like how do we, how do we find opportunities for, you know, f- f- for particularly traditional owners to, to, mm. to derive an income by being custodians of, you know, of nature and protect biodiversity and restore, you know, restore connectivity between uh, existing remnant vegetation and, and get back to that 30% goal that the, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity aims for of 30% of land managed for nature. And yeah, it's a, it's, mm. a, it's a project that, that we sort of um, dreamt up not in a not in a flippant way but in a in a dreaming sort of aspirational way and i think it really provides for us a really good sort of example of what can be done and um hopefully we can do more of that sort of stuff yeah absolutely it's i mean i wonder whether you would be able to enable that sort of work without the the carbon element you know probably more so now you you could but you know five, five years ago six years ago it might have been a bit more difficult but I mean, now it's gotten to the point where this idea of biodiversity conservation and management can sort of go off on its own without the yeah, carbon yeah, component, right. and without the and carbon. that's yeah, and that's actually lo- uh, led to the launch of of Wilderlands, which was that last week you did the the formal the, the formal yeah. launch of Wilderlands, yeah. Well, we launched the idea of Wilderlands. We haven't actually launched okay. the platform yet. It's so, more of a conceptual um, sort of launch. Yeah, it was like okay. it was mostly to do with. Um, you know, friends and, and partners saying, here's an idea that, that we've been thinking about. Um, and look, going back to carbon, like you mentioned, um, like this is all really enabled by the carbon market. Like mm. 25 years ago, we wouldn't have even had the capacity to think about things like this because, you know, the framework for hanging these thoughts on hadn't been developed and that was still developed mm. through carbon. So we've got, we've got that to be thankful for. Um, you know, this is all an outcome of the fact that the carbon markets have have developed the way we can think about things like nature-based solutions and biodiversity credits and that sort of thing. But yeah, last week we did this launch, um, had about 80 people along to the launch and, and we shared the idea and we launched the white paper, which is the, the sort of conceptual framework for how we'd think about a biodiversity unit in 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 an Australian context, yeah. What does that? Do you want like? to give the little in the, the like the little background of, about what exactly it is the Wildlands yeah. product? Yeah. So the yeah Wildlands product. So so re, um, going back to the Convention on on Biological Diversity, um, we're, we've recognised, I guess, that there's no framework for people to invest in the uh, aspirations of the Convention on Biological Diversity outside of carbon. So carbon covers the maybe the reveg components of it, the components and maybe red where forests are under threat and we can we can protect that forest degradation. But but if it's just it, forest degradation from a carbon perspective, but it's just if it's just biodiversity and it's potentially either being lost, not without losing the carbon or it's too small to develop a red project or whatever, we're still seeing a, a significant amount of loss every year of the integrity of the biodiversity of, of, of Australia's you know, natural, natural areas. So how do we protect that? How do we, how do we realize the 70, I think it's 77 million hectares of Australia that need to be protected in order for Australia to reach even the simplest version of its 30% target of 30% of land protected for nature. There's no mechanism at the moment by which, you know, anyone can do it other than go and buy a property and, you know, spend a lot of money and, and sort of do it yourself. So Woodlands is a way of unitizing that gain right down to the square metre. And what does it look like to protect, uh, protect in perpetuity manage for 20 years um, and invest in that biodiversity action around protection and, and management for biodiversity. Um, so we're launching a, a new product called a biological diversity unit that will just talk to biodiversity. There's no 
I mean, there obviously is some carbon benefits to it, but we're not representing those. We're not calculating those. We're not getting that accredited, but getting a, a, a biodiversity credit um, accredited, have an independent register that's audited and how do we move and, and take that, the biodiversity goals and the biodiversity opportunities down the same path as carbon went, you know, 20 years ago and has been improving that, that journey, the carbon journey for the last 20 years. How do we sort of hitchhike on that road, if you like, and uh, create a similar opportunity for biodiversity? So that's what Woodlands is, that's what Woodlands is about. You Woodlands think it has the same... if I can plug it as a yeah, yeah. thing, and we'd love Good people plug. to give their considered feedback at the moment. The, the platform itself won't be launched for a couple of months, but the white paper's downloadable. And um, yeah, we're looking for constructive thinking around what that might look like. And what was the the, the website for that one more time? Uh, Woodlands.co. .co. Um, okay. .co or .org. We didn't, we, didn't, uh, we didn't get .com yet, but... Not yet. Wait for it to, yeah. to really launch, get off the ground. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Feels, so yeah. do, do you see uh, the biodiversity market having the potential to to go down the same trajectory as, as the carbon market? I mean, I know, really we hope probably so. wouldn't have seen where the carbon market is today. You know, no. I don't think anyone would have, I mean, maybe some people predicted it five years ago, but the immense yeah. growth in the last two years has just been, mm. been mad. Yeah, I think so. I think it'll follow a similar trajectory i think people are going to wake up at some point and, and realize that this biodiversity crisis is as significant as the climate crisis and we need to resource this in the same way that we have carbon and where we can get both at the same time we need to focus on that so i think i think it will um you know woodlands won't be the final word in in biodiversity response but i think it's a good um early step and uh yeah it sure needs it because i say that um at least in theory climate change is reversible but biodiversity loss it's not even theoretically reversible once it's gone it's gone so hmm. we need to really we need to get ahead around the fact that we're on a massive extinction event at the moment um that we need to invest in not you know not seeing that terrible future eventuate because even if we did stop climate change in 100 years what's one of the main reasons we want to stop climate change is so we don't lose all these species and if in 100 years we realize oh man we did it oh actually the species have all gone We've lost all these species reasons. anyway oops yep. oh we should have thought of that um so yeah. anyway. this reminds me of yeah. a of a, a metaphor like the shipwreck metaphor which i've heard you use before <laughs> which i think is it's a good yes. one actually i think it's a good metaphor yeah metaphors and analogies I, I i tend to get um famous for them at team meetings but but i do like the shipwreck metaphor that we're at that point in history now where where the shipwreck is happening and all the cargo of the ship is washing up on shore and the time now is to grab that cargo and bring it up onto the above the waves and we, now's not the time to start drying it out or or you know trying to you know um get it perfectly right the time now is just to capture as much of it as we can so in australia we've you know we've um we've still got an immense amount of private land biodiversity left um but it's being degraded significantly every year so now i think our job is as as practitioners in this space i think our main role you know at this point in history probably for the next 10 or 20 years is just going to be to get as much of that protected permanently as we can um, concurrent to try to reconnect it because the threats of isolation of these beautiful private patches of biodiversity that are left the threat of isolation is a real one and so species that are left sort of abandoned on the island will eventually either inbreed or get taken out by a, a catastrophic event like a bushfire or a drought, and then they'll be lost. So we've got these islands of biodiversity left. They need to be reconnected, but they need to be protected 
first. So that's what we're on. And then once we've got all the cargo, if you like, off the off the beach and, the and metaphor continues. then we can the metaphor continues. Then we start, you know, drying out the paper and making sure the books are, you know, are, you know, are, are restored and and the, the detail of biodiversity restoration at the micro level, you know, that's that's when that happens. Mm, so there's this underlying yeah. urg urgency for, for, you know, better that's stewardship of the land. And, and I mean, yeah. that sort of brings up another another element to what Cassinia does. I mean, we spoke about, um, you know, the carbon side and the, and the conservation side, but it's also about sustainable agriculture as well, because mm. necessarily, you know, to have a functioning society, we need enormous mm. resources of land resources put into, into agriculture. But yeah, at the same yeah. time, we need to have practices that'll... Um, that'll make that uh, sustainable. And so yeah. could you talk a little bit about how Cassinia works to, to integrate sustainable agriculture into conservation, into climate change, mm. and, you know, all these, all these interesting ways? Yeah. I'd start by saying, I think farmers are probably some of the least recognised um, professionals in society because what they do on their farms and, and what they create for the rest of everybody is amazing. Like, you know, mm -hmm. we just take it for granted. We can walk into the supermarket and buy all this different food and, and, you know, it's, you know, relative to our incomes, it's not that expensive and it sustains us. And we drive around, you know, rural areas and we just see paddocks and, and it's those individuals that are creating from those paddocks, the food we eat and, and, and it's amazing. This, the current, you know, international crisis might suddenly bring farmers into the spotlight. If you like, like the nurses of the pandemic, you know, suddenly we all mm. respected and loved the health professionals and how amazing they are. We might end up doing that to farmers through this, this potential crisis we might be on the edge of. So I'll say that because I, I really have a lot of respect for what, what farmers do, no matter which sort of farmers they are. But, but when it comes to really embedding you know, the aspirations we have for managing nature and protecting nature well, I think we can do both. I think we can both be, you know, able to feed the world and able to protect nature. So we've, we've done a, a few projects now that sort of really embed that, that nature piece into agricultural landscapes. And just broadly speaking, it's, it, it's about 30% of landscapes going going back to, to being managed for nature. Um, and then it's about managing the, the 70 or 65 or 70% that is managed for agriculture, managing in a way that's very sympathetic to the 30% that's managed for nature. So we're not using products or chemicals that are, are gonna have a negative, a significant negative impact on the areas that are managed for nature. Uh, and, and managing land systems according to their capability. So some, obviously some land systems are, are much more uh, resilient than others. And so being very careful about managing the agriculture um, according to the capacity of, that, of the system. So we, we've got one project um, in Victoria that, uh, that you had a fair bit to do with when you were, when you were over here at Rokewood. And, um, I think the natural, we're calling it natural agriculture as a, as a model for that farm. So the natural agriculture model for that farm is that uh, a third of it, in that case, a bit over a third goes back to nature. Um, so we've planted about 200 hectares of that property. Um, yeah, hopefully approximately 200,000 new trees will be coming up and protecting a big buffer around the waterways of that project and all the steep and, and most fragile areas will be replanted and protected. And then the remaining seven or 800, in that case, seven or 800 acres, so whatever that is, 350 hectares, something like that, um, is managed for agriculture, but only certain parts of that could be cropped because the soils are resilient enough to be able to, to manage that. Most of it will just be grazed. And, um, and trying to keep the grazing uh, they're quite sympathetic to to what other natural assets that we've got as well. Um, and I'll jump from that project to another one we've got um, a bit further north 
which has traditionally been always a grazing property and has never been cropped. And we've found a, a couple of critically endangered species on that property. So obviously they've been, um, you know, they've been able to thrive sympathetic to the, to the grazing system. So in that particular case, we're saying, well, how do we manage this agricultural system in order to protect those, those endangered species that we've got on this, on this space? So we can, in those cases, do both. We do have to take a, a cut in production, uh, at least in the short term, um, in order to, to realise those biodiversity goals, because we're not running the properties as hard as they could possibly run. But um, it, it's really a, a, a happy medium, really, uh, the right medium between what is sustainable both for agriculture and for those other species, for nature. That was a bit of a monologue, but... I don't know. That's, yeah. it's, it's so interesting that you've, you've already sort of developed this, this blueprint that seems to be working, you know, this approximately 30-70 split. Um, mm. But I, I mean, could you talk a bit more about this, I mean, this Rokewood project, it reminds me of this, mm. this idea of a, you know, sustainable agriculture community. Mm. Um, mm. And, you know, and, and the, the piece where you have, you know, lots of people the community getting piece involved too, in yeah. this project. Yeah, that's yeah. right, which is, I feel like it's so integral into, into an effective I, it, you know, landscape it, restoration project. Yeah, it is. I think it is too. And it's interesting. Um, we did a presentation recently called The Paradox of Land Management. And the paradox is that agriculture, did I tell you about this already? Uh, no, the, the title no, is, is it. interesting. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's a good title. Um because it's a paradox that agriculture, like we've got, we've got bigger gear, we've got more efficient technology, we've got better chemicals, we've got all this, so many drivers that mean you need less and less and less people in the landscape. And you need, in order to be viable, because, you know, with the exception of the last few years, commodity prices in, in real terms have been dropping and dropping and dropping for decades. So in order for farmers to be viable, they need to get bigger in order to justify the size of their big gear, they need to get even bigger. Like the, the push is on for less and less people to be in the landscape to make productive land. At the same time, we've got all these threats to nature and, and you, can't, you can't go over with a boom spray over a nature area and say, we're just gonna take out all the weeds because everything's integrated. And so from a natural perspective, we need more people in the landscape. So the paradox of land management is that agriculture is pushing for economies of scale and less people and nature restoration is pushing for more people who can take an interest and really make sure we get this right so we've got these two things um, pulling in different directions um, and the idea of natural agriculture communities is that they bridge that paradox by saying well let's bring more people into the landscape and let's um, let's create a community around an environmental project that people, in this case, in the case of Rokewood, people will commit to five hours a month of environmental work from their household. So just five hours a month, that's all. Five hours a month, yeah. So in that case, we might have 10 or 15 potential families living on that, that project. So we might have 50 to 80 hours a month of environmental work happening. So this is restoration of the ecosystems along the waterways, control of the threats, both weeds and pests, and then restoration. Maybe in future we'll do some reintroductions of species that have gone extinct in the region. And we need to have enough people in that landscape to be able to put in the energy to deliver those outcomes. But at the same time, we need effectively, we only it's it's only one farming unit. So everybody has the right to to dwell in that landscape say on a hectare or something like that but the majority of the land is run by one farmer as one agricultural enterprise and can realize that economy of scale that is basically where agriculture is at now particularly in australia that unless you're you know at a reasonable scale um it's just not viable so yeah that and then you've got the third piece really that sits in there haven't you you've got the agriculture piece you've got the conservation piece and then you've got the social piece and weaving all those together, I think um, is, yeah, is something that we're going to be focused on, you know, for the next period. Cause yeah, I think it's healthy for people too, to be, to be living in, in systems that are natural and agricultural. I mean, this is, this is the 
this is the nature that sustains us and this is the food that sustains us so i think it's healthy all around to see that that revolution go back to more people living in and understanding and working with nature and agriculture and it, it, i mean i find it interesting like this sustainable community um who do you see as being like the target audience, the people that are coming into yeah, these communities, you know, is it like um, well, you know, like retired couples, you know, moving out from the city or you're looking for the tree change or is it perhaps younger people that, you know, uh, are just looking to escape the city, yeah, particularly it's, after it's the good, pandemic? I think it'll be a bit of everything. Mm. We, we, we did one before, like the first project of this type we did was like no agriculture. It was just um, nature. And we're like, who are we going to get? Uh, um, <laughs> I, th I thought oh, it'll be a bunch of sort of hippies who just want to get back to nature. And the first guy that bought a property in this first ever property we sold, they say you don't need to be a, they don't need to be a, a like a nuclear scientist to, to understand this stuff. This guy was like the guy who was heading up the synchrotron in Melbourne. Like he was a PhD. Oh, he was actually a nuclear yeah. scientist. He was a PhD <laughs> in atomic physics or whatever it is. And, and it's like, oh, wow. well, you can be a, you know, you can be a nuclear scientist or, um, oh, yeah. Anyway, he was, he was off the charts that way. But then we, you know, we had a really interesting diversity of engineers and, um, and, you know, professional people working in conservation and retired and, you know, it's, a, and it's created a community. I think since the pandemic, I think, think the, the scope of people who are, sort of resonating with this stuff has really increased because people have 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 a real desire to reconnect with the natural world i think um maybe it's just melbourne that went through the longest lockdown of any city in the world <laughs> good <laughs> times. experience from your from your yeah. perspective but, <laughs> a fun couple of years there yeah yeah but i think i think it's I, and I think now that we've all learned to do Zoom and stuff, I think the potential for people to really reconnect with nature, to be actually physically hands-on part of the solution, not just theoretically part of the solution, while working, you know, their real job, um, potentially, you know, on Zoom from home. I think it's it's a beautiful point in, in history. So, so I don't know exactly what the profile will be, but I think it'll be diverse. I think it'll be a bit of everything. Yeah. I mean, I think this point of like buy-in from the community and, and what you mentioned about farmers really being almost the gatekeepers of this this stewardship that we have mm. of the environment and also the fact that you studied this, you know, um, mm. 25, 30 years ago, whenever years it was. Ago. Have, have yeah. you seen like the, you know, the mindset of the culture around farmers and, and their relationship to, to climate change and the environment? Has that changed at all? Have, has there been any, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. Evolution of that over the years. Yeah. Um, I think so. I think so. I did my first. I did my first uh, degree and my second degree. Really, I, they were both research. I finished off my bachelor degree with a big research project, and my master's was was mainly research, looking at how farmers value nature. And there was a real. Um, I think there was a real sh um, sort of split between. Um, it'd be interesting to do a, a study on this, but a split between people who had been paid, incentivized by the government to clear land um, and people who hadn't. So even in the 70s, um, the government was paying people in Victoria to knock down trees and turn, it, turn biodiversity into agriculture. Mm. And the farmers who'd gone through that phase and been part of it, put their, you know, their back into it and, and worked hard and 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 carved out a you know a farm out of the wilderness and you know their their identity and the the sweat of their brow was was in that. I felt like there was a, a definite shift between people who'd been through that and people who had come after that. And those people now who'd been through that are are pretty much you know retired now. And I'd say that the the, the overwhelming majority of landholders came after that now. So I think there has been a shift and, and I, I, I'd, I'd probably put it down to the, the, you know, and it's probably happened in the late seventies where we started to shift from thinking of, shift from thinking of nature as purely utilitarian to 
nature having intrinsic value of its own and and moving from a an exploitative perhaps and that might be too harsh but a um a transactive way of thinking about land to a real a more of a stewardship way of caring for country and caring for land um and that you know it started in the early 80s i would say i mean it, in some ways it had been around for a long time but I, I feel like the current evolution of it started in the 80s and then in australia land care the land care movement which in at at, at its peak encompassed sort of a third or maybe even up to 40 percent of of all landholders were involved in this thing called land care and wow. the huge shift it's amazing thinking yeah isn't it mm. amazing of, of the way we think about land so I, th I think it i think it's shifted and i think it's shifting yet at the same time i'd say i think farmers have always been um always had a special relationship with land and, and we think of indigenous people and their the way they think about you know, them belonging to country rather than country belonging to them. I think for a lot of farmers, um, the relationship they end up having with their with their land is is similar to the way Indigenous people have a relationship with land. Different, mm. but similar too, because it becomes it becomes a it becomes a relationship. It's it's not just a a transaction uh, for a lot of farmers. Now, some you know, and the rise of corporate farming and you know, sort of fly in, fly out farming is is changing that. Mm. Um, but I think for a lot of farmers, it's very relational. Well, it's interesting that you bring up this, like this new relationship with, with um, you know, with the environment, particularly from landholders. Mm. Do you think that, you know, the carbon market is essentially valuing nature and creating that mm. transaction mm. relationship? Maybe it, is it bringing us backwards? Are we, are we developing the wrong... <laughs> relationship with nature i mean obviously this comes back to the shipwreck no we're just doing everything yeah, yeah. it's urgent we're just doing what we can yeah. but like in the long yeah. term maybe we need to be thinking a bit differently about how we're valuing nature how do you see that yeah i think so i think so i think um i mean I, you know i i was on a zoom call the other day with a somebody and they said other things that should just not be valued like <laughs> if i have to pay you to be married to you is that does that describe a marriage? You know, if you have to pay someone to stay married to you, does that describe what marriage is? Or is that is that a relationship that's beyond money? And if I if I put a value on nature, is that a, an abuse of of that relationship? Um, and I, I thought about that, and I thought I, I agree with him on the marriage thing. I don't think that would constitute a marriage, but but um, I think about I think we actually do put a value on nature at the moment and Definitely. that value is mm. zero. It's worth nothing. <laughs> so like, you know, in, in the, in the farmer, in the landholder, who's trying to manage nature and the way society looks at them and what they're doing, um, they mm. value it at zero because they don't get paid to do it. So, and traditionally it's been not only an economic zero, but it's been a sort of a social zero as well. Mm. Now I think there's a social value that's significant, but there's not an economic value. But I think what we're trying to do, you know, and why nature-based solutions, um, you know, and why the carbon market around nature-based, you know, nature-based approaches to carbon markets are so important is it begins to, to value um, even more than put a value, but it begins to value the contribution that that land managers deliver when they're looking, you know, looking after the natural world properly. And I think that's why it's so exciting with the, you know, the Mount Sandy example we talked about before and traditional owners getting back onto country and it's really valuing, it's putting value on the relationship that they have as being good custodians of country. And up until this point, you know, that was valued at zero. So, you know, sure you could do it, but um, you also had to have a real job to, you know, pay for food and pay the mortgage. So I think it's amazing. I think it's really a really significant shift that we're, we're finding ways to value these ecosystem services that provide so much economic value to us, but, and, but before now we've just valued them at zero so it's a, it's a step in the right direction you know it might not be oh, the perfect end game incredible. of how we do it but it's we're <laughs> heading in, in the right direction 
Well, that's right. We, we, maybe we were way over time, but um, my son sent me a, a little podcast um, saying our carbon offsets a scam and, and, and sort of <laughs> highlighted some of the challenges that different, different carbon um, approaches to um, sequestering or, or mitigating carbon emissions have had. And I, I just feel like that's so missing the point that we're actually iterating towards, you know, the right solution. And the fact that sometimes on those iterations, things aren't as easy and as straightforward as we thought they might be. And sometimes we hit some roadblocks that we didn't expect to hit. That by no means takes away from the fact that this is an absolutely valuable journey to be on, a necessary journey. And we're not going to land on the perfect solution on the first try um, and we're getting better every year we're getting better in every iteration and yeah so absolutely yeah i love how much of an optimist you are it's um it's you know, <laughs> anytime i'm feeling down about the climate crisis or the state oh. of the world I, I can talk to you and it, it brings me back up to where i need to be um, well maybe yeah um yeah maybe yeah well, I think it's healthier to have hope than have no hope. But I think there's so much to be hopeful for. There's so much that is not yet lost. So it's so yeah. important that we um, that we work hard to, you know, protect and to um, to restore um, this 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 beautiful beautiful um, planet that we get to call home. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, I normally like to finish on a sort of a, like a you know, what are the biggest obstacles that you see and, you know, and what are the biggest opportunities? But I know that with you, you know, obstacles yes, almost are opportunities. They're, they're almost <laughs> the same thing that comes back to your optimism. Uh, um, uh, you know, so I'll put that to you in Australia, um, you know, in the carbon space, climate change um, space, mm. ecosystem restoration. Like what are the, the biggest obstacles that the developers like you are, are facing at the moment? Mm. Um. Well, I, I guess the biggest obstacle um, has been, for, you know, putting on my hat of integrating carbon and biodiversity, the biggest obstacle um, has been, you know, the legitimacy of nature. This is over the last 20 years. The legitimacy of nature-based solutions is a really appropriate way of mitigating climate change. Um, but I think we've turned the corner there. I think now the biggest obstacle um, we're going to face well, one of the biggest obstacles is, you know, is the fact that uh, land prices have increased so much, and and it's still very difficult to to make these projects stack up financially at, at scale. Mm. Um, so I think we need to keep thinking around that. And that's why I'm really excited about about the opportunity to to value other ecosystem services, not just carbon, and and how do we, you know, how do we see more of the of the of the nature problem or the nature challenge be able to be invested in, you know, by companies or governments or individuals. So I'm optimistic about that, but I think that's still a big challenge and we're still a long mm. way away from, you know, we're still a long way away from, you know, hitting um, equilibrium. We're still going downhill in terms of um, oh, yeah. nature loss in Australia. So, um, but I think, you know, we've got, we've got sentiment on our side, um, we've got human energy and, and human intelligence working on this. So I, I, am, I am optimistic that, um, that we'll be able to turn this around. And I think, you know, by 2030, I mean, this is being realistic. You know, I'd hope by 2030, we've, we've passed the point of, of nature loss and we're starting to move into nature gain territory. And, um, and there'll be other technologies that help us along the way with agriculture too, that'll see agriculture become more efficient and less reliant on the scale that perhaps it is now. And we'll be able to see some of those efficiencies lead to more land become available for nature and really start to restore those linkages in the landscape. Um, and there's also huge opportunities, I think, with, with technology to be able to help control some of the challenges that we have to biodiversity loss. So. Um, you know, my optimism is is built in a in a in a construct of you know we're still going down we're still going downhill at the moment we're still losing more than we're gaining but but I think the the tide is with us and by I'd say realistically if it continues on this trajectory by 2030 we'll have turned the corner. 
um, mm. this is on the biodiversity corner. And maybe, you know, maybe the maybe the the emissions and the the renewables and the, that shift from um, you know more carbon going into the atmosphere to less going into the atmosphere in the absence of a pandemic might have shifted by then too. So yeah. So in summary, it, there's plenty of obstacles, but it's going in the right direction. The tide is with us. Maybe that's <laughs> the, the tide point is with of, us. The, of the podcast. I love that. Yeah, the tide okay. is, That's I, what we'll title this episode, maybe. The tide is with us. The tide is with us, but yeah, you still need to maintain a fair bit of, um, um, you know, sort of grit your teeth and smile optimism <laughs> because it's not always obvious. Um, yeah. But it's great to be able to share um, that perspective, and and thanks for giving me all the time in the world to uh, explain my analogies. And no, uh, I, I could listen to it all day. Uh, I, I love the optimism, and I hope anyone who listens to this can uh, can really draw some energy from it, um, because I know, yeah, yeah I, I always do. Um, and and let us always remember that the tide is with us, and the tide you know, is we just with need us. to get on the surfboard or some other Australian good, good analogy. Hope, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks, thanks so much time, for joining, Dave. Paul. And, no um, worries at all. Hopefully we'll get you on again. Time. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, <laughs> cheers. All right, perfect. See you, Paul.